Tim is the ventilator lead for Helpful Engineering. And he'll talk more about what Helpful Engineering is, but he's, he's one of the co-hosts of this sponsor, of this uh, conference. Um, yeah, so um, I can get going on my presentation, uh, kind of introduce Helpful, uh, as well as kind of how we see the space going forward. Um, so yeah, I'm Tim Arts um, from Helpful Engineering. Um, I've been heading up our ventilator space. Um, we're a, a, a big organization than just ventilators. Um, and I can uh, get into that if we go to the next slide. So uh, Helpful Engineering was founded um, just a few months ago um, uh, to, and, and kind of based on uh, the, the, the theory of effective altruism um, of um, uh, doing the most good um, uh, that, that we can. Um, I think we're out of presentation mode uh, on the, uh, there, all right. Um, and um, yeah, so we, we uh, currently have about 3,400 registered volunteers who are, who are working with us. Um, and um, that's just the volunteers we have in our uh, kind of expanded database. We have 16,000 plus signed up for our Slack. Um, we don't have 16,000 act, act, very active users in our Slack. I don't want to um, pretend that, um, but we do have thousands uh, working currently. Um, and, and, and it started in, in response to the, the COVID crisis uh, and uh, started as a place where engineers would just kind of come together, um, connect with each other, try to build projects and people would join and say, well, I got, a, I got an idea for this and get together uh, and, and start working on it and start building solutions uh, for, um, for in response to the crisis. And, 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 and now we've really developed into a, a, an incubator um, for these COVID-19 related projects with a lot of infrastructure in place um, to help uh, people who, who want to help um, and have skills to connect um, and get their projects, make their projects a reality um, through a lot of the resources we gathered together and um, put into uh, practice. So um, I have our vision statement there. I'm not necessarily going to read it, um, uh, but that's kind of our North Star at the moment. Um, for, for, for what we're trying to do um, and, and, and where we're trying to go. Um, and um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, the, the way the helpful is kind of organized is that we have basically three main layers. Um, one is, is, is where we really started, uh, where anyone can join and start a project. Uh, you all, a lot of you are on the Slack right now, um, and you can um, uh, uh, you, you can start a project on there right now um, if you wanted to and, and, and say, I have this idea. Um, we'll start you a Slack channel, get together, find people, um, and uh, you can use our network of people um, and, and uh, the, 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 the just thousands of engineers who are on Helpful's Slack um, to, to start developing a project. And once your project has developed a little bit and, and, and you have um, an idea, you have, you're starting to go forward with design, um, you can, we have, we have a rolling pro a proposal and acceptance process um, where you can uh, uh, submit a proposal um, and then become an officially supported project. And what that means um, is that you unlock these additional resources um, such as our manufacturing connections, legal assistance, um, publicity, um, funding, um, to, to, to start moving your idea and your, um, your project to, um, uh, to, to, to more of a reality. Um, and uh, not that a lot of those things aren't uh, kind of ancillarily available to swarm projects and, and not that there aren't swarm projects that are um, very far along and close, and close to or are currently being produced. Um, but it, the, the, this is just kind of the, the way things go. And then once your project's ready to launch, we help you in spinning off your organization into your own organization. Uh, Helpful is not interested in being um, a, like an IP holder. Um, we're all open source. We, we're not interested in, um, in, in, in grabbing your idea and making it our own. Um, we, are, we, we want you to be your own organization, um, but we want to make sure you have the resources to, 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 to get there. Um, and um, that's, that's just kind of how we're organized. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so the, uh, uh, I think the, the best example of how we do this and, and, and 
why I'm talking about all of this um, is, um, is, is um, I think, our, our, our PPE projects. Our PPE projects, uh, personal protective equipment, um, have already moved forward, um, and we've already spun off um, uh, what we call the mass project, um, which is doing, which is making face shields, um, and really close to releasing their um, safe, reusable respirators. Um, this mass project started off as a swarm project, uh, got official. We launched it. Um, and we've already delivered hundreds of thousands of face shields um, to um, uh, different community centers, um, healthcare centers, and, uh, and such. Uh, and and there, we, we've worked with Coca Cola. Coca Cola is providing the plastic, and it's a, it's a flat pack, um, super lightweight, super easy to make um, face shield uh, that, that we've produced and distributed. Um, and it's, it's just a good example of an idea that someone had, and then and, and now it's it's in production um, uh, based on um, uh, our organization. Um, uh, additionally, in the UK, we have 15,000 face shields already delivered to hospitals, uh, care homes, clinics, um, uh, and then uh, we have more PPE projects ongoing, more respirators. Uh, the material for N95 masks is 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 really in low supply, and so we're, we're developing our own. There um, as well, and we've had a lot of success in cloth masks. That one's just about spun out um, into its own organization, uh, and, and so um, uh, with PPE, um, we, we we learned a lot of things, and that's kind of uh, our, our our pathway and and how this relates to open source ventilation um, is that um, we uh, v ventilators are much more complicated mechanically, electrically, or electronically. Um, and, and I think most importantly, uh, regulatorily, um, uh, it's 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 a it's a getting a supply chain in place um, and uh, moving forward um, with a a ventilator, an open source ventilator into the in, into the into the actual market um, is is a really big undertaking. And so we thought um, that we would start with PPE um, because it's a little more it's a little um, simpler. Um, in terms of regulation um, and technology, and so um, the PPE is is in and of itself, um, I could be the highest need we have right now, anyways. So it's it's obviously a good a good way to go, um, uh, but um, we also saw it as a test bed for more complicated projects um, because we weren't interested in just doing PPE. We have so many people we're interested in doing a lot of things. So if we move to the next slide. Um, uh, we can move to our ventilators. Um, and so uh, we have a, a wide variety um, of ventilators um, that we're working on um, and we've, we're using the lessons we learned in PPE to get those to market. Um, um, let me just pause my notification. Um, yeah, to, to, to get those to market. And so we have three uh, officially supported, so kind of in that second um, tranche of um, projects, uh, ventilator projects, offset ventilator, which is an Andu bag BBM pressing one, army ventilator, which has no moving parts, um, is all new, uh, is all um, venturi based, and then Respire Works, which is pneumatic. Um, we have three other active swarm ventilator projects, and then um, three ventilator module projects, which I think we're going to get into a lot today, um, is looking at the modularization of ventilators, um, and that's something that is important to us. Um, and, and those are flow volume sensors. Uh, as well as a manometer, which is which was spun off of um, a different ventilator project, um, as as we as we saw need for it, um, and so um, I, I, I'm not going to get into the specific ventilator projects because that's not really the focus of the conference. As is any one tech one technology, um, but uh, we are working on a wide range of ventilator projects, and and we are open to more. Um, and 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 we, uh, if we if we can go to the next slide. Um, we, as a group and, and as, a, as a ventilator group, um, uh, really view safety and testing as the number one priority. Uh, and so um, having a, uh, this, this wide range of projects and some that might overlap with existing um, projects out there, such as our Andabeg presser, um, you might say, oh, there's a thousand of those. Why are you guys working on it? Um, and, and I think that safety and testing is, is really the answer to, to, to that question. Um, we have looked at a lot of um, uh, products out there, uh, and we don't believe that all of them are safe. 
um, and that's a big problem. Uh, it, it, and so uh, we are um, um, uh, choosing to find the most stringent um, uh, regulations that we can and trying to follow them. Um, and so um, all our projects um, are going to be um, look, uh, uh, um, looking to the FDA standards um, and, and greater. Um, for uh, approval, um, or, or for for uh, our own internal approval, um, we uh, we think that patient safety has to be number one. Um, there is a way to do this safely. Uh, there is a great need, uh, but that doesn't mean that we can cut corners, and and, and especially doesn't mean we can cut corners um, if we're working in a space that we're not used to. Um, the, the 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 nature of this panic um, and uh, fastness um, is such that we have to keep testing as our number one. Um, and if there's anything um, we could take from the presentation, it's, it, it's that is, is I think that testing and meeting um, ISO and other um, safety regulations is, is, is number one. Um, uh, additionally, um, we're looking at the open sourcing and open licensing. Open sourcing is at the core of what we do. Um, and um, in looking at FDA approval, there's current, currently only one uh, FDA approved open source ventilator. Um, and uh, uh, we'd like to see more because, and we'd like to see that open source ventilator to be more open source. Um, they have a paper out, um, it's the MBM ventilator um, and, and they have a paper out um, but we don't believe it's full design documents. Um, and um, we, um, we are looking for that from them. Um, uh, some other thoughts. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I, I, I lost rest there for a second. Um, there are, what we are seeing um, it, with the FDA um, is that there's a lot of open licensing happening where people are giving away their licenses for free um, to, to license their product. And, and a big reason for that with the FDA um, is that um, when you get approved with the FDA, you don't get approved um, for um, um, a design, you get approved for a design paired with manufacturing. And that's an important part of thinking about this whole open source, open source space that is maybe a little foreign to us makers who's kind of want to do it and get it done, build it, have it out there. Um, and, and, and at the manufacturing side of it um, is, is where a lot of the safety checks lie. Uh, and so, um, uh, that's why I. That's why I think we're seeing a lot of more open licensing rather than open sourcing um, in the kind of more approved space, um, and and I think it's important to uh, uh, to to really center manufacturing um, and and be thinking about manufacturing from the beginning, and that's something that we're running into um, in in looking at our approval um, and our applications is 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 having a manufacturer in place um, even when you are trying to. Uh, uh, to be approved. Um, so, so, so think about manufacturing uh, and, ma and make sure um, you have a plan for that and that, uh, um, yeah. Um, and then uh, when you look at our um, landscape, our, we, you can see that we, we, we do believe in a variety of uh, ventilators. Um, we have a, a bunch of different types um, and we believe we, we, as, as COVID has kind of as treatment for COVID has changed throughout the time um, of the crisis, we, we, we have seen the treatment plans um, change a little bit over time. Um, and so we believe that having a variety of technologies out there to um, address uh, different treatment types and different needs um, is important. Um, but we also obviously see uh, benefits to consolidation, um, which is where I think a lot of what um, uh, the other panelists who are um, talking about modularization, where that where that comes in, that um, there's a there, there, that if everyone is working on the same thing, um, we're wasting a lot of effort. Um, and so uh, having some consolidation into different parts of the ventilator, I think is is I think we would agree is a is, is a great idea. Um, we're always open to a better way of doing things. Um, we have um, changed designs, taken designs, um, and uh, are are really open to. Um, if, if anyone here wants to join and think that we could do things better, um, come on in uh, and we will uh, listen to you. So um, uh, with that, um, I think I can answer a few questions. If there's a little time, I see that there's some questions around. Um, 
uh, someone asked um, how are the swarm ventilator projects different from other ventilator projects. Um, swarm ventilator projects uh, are uh, don't have as many resources, uh, don't have any of the helpful engineering official resources given to them um, uh, because we just don't have enough resources to, to have every single person who makes a project come in um, receive. Um, uh, and that, 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 that's the main difference. Um, uh, Emilio asked, does an organization similar to the FDA, but in another country provide approvals that are not necessarily tied to manufacturing facility? If so, why not follow those standards and get those approvals instead of FDA's approval? That's a good question. Um, there are other organizations um, that are providing approval. If you look at the UK, they have a totally different standard. Um, their emergency use standard um, uh, is, is is very different, um, and we believe um, that it's important to that that these that these standards uh, meeting the standards that are the most stringent is important. Um, it's kind of uh, part of our philosophy in the ventilator space of helpful engineering, um, in that we don't see regulations as um, things to get around or overcome, um, and uh, we we see them as uh, as it's kind of a guiding light. Um, to make sure that we're being safe. Um, the, the, these regulations for manufacturing are there for a reason. Um, and, um, and, and, we, and, and we are, we are trying to, to, to meet those. Um, and, um, but yeah, we could, we could get approved somewhere if we wanted to or, or, or start selling ventilators in a space that doesn't have as, as high approval standards, but um, we're not, we're, we're, it, it'd be so easy to miss something. Um, we'd rather um, go for the go for the um, kind of higher standards. Um, uh, so, um, what other any Rob? Do you have any other questions? I saw I saw a couple come in that I don't see anymore. Um, yeah, there is one question that came in on Slack. Thank you very much. Um, it, it is currently ventilator manufacturers are struggling with flow sensors. I heard there is a repository of flow sensor manufacturers as well as open source flow sensor solutions. It would be great if someone can point me in that direction. Yeah, so um, in the uh, in in, in I, I can answer for our organization in that uh, we our our organization has uh, oh I see that channel now. Um, uh, our organization has two flow sensor specific projects and, and then two of our pro three of our projects have their own flow sensor um, flow uh, sensor um, uh, components to their to their ventilators, which is also showing you know a need for for consolidation but um, we've talked very in depth about that and, and, and believe that all of our sensors are, are it, that we're supporting all of them at this moment. We have enough people um, that it's worth moving forward with all of them. Um, and so if you um, search the helpful Slack for flow sensor, um, you should be uh, able to find them. So there's project flow sensor, there's um, project VISP. Um, if you're in our Slack, you can search for, um, as well as um, in some of our, um, actually all three of our um, official projects have that uh, aspect of, aspect to it as well. Um, okay, so um, let me um, let me interrupt you there, Tim. In the interest yeah, of sure. time, I'm afraid we, we have to go on. Yep. Um, I just want to uh, tell the attendees, we are looking at the questions posted in Sharp VentCon 2020 questions. It's just there are too many questions for us to answer completely. Yeah, and, I, and I'll, jump, I'll jump in there and answer questions um, on the Slack as we go on. Great, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to have to go on to uh, my uh, presentation now to stay on time. So a lot of what I'm going to say meshes very nicely with what Tim said. Um, the title of my talk is Building an Open Ventilator Ecosystem. And this is work that was uh, co-started with Jenny Filippetti. Um, so I'd like to tell you a story. And the story is the story of the pandemic ventilator crisis as I see it. Uh, in the last 10 weeks, a lot has happened. Um, this graph represents the need for pandemic uh, ventilators on the vertical scale and time on the horizontal scale. Um, on March 7th, there was complete chaos. And it appeared that even in the wealthiest nations, 
there were not going to be enough ventilators to keep people alive, which would increase the mortality of the disease. Um, around March 15th, everyone became aware of this and helpful engineering, for example, started and approximately 100 isolated teams started building ventilators. And thank you very much if you're one of those teams. Um, on April 1st, something important happened. The Israeli AmboVent team released the first open source uh, system that I think was documented well enough to be reproduced by an outside party. And so that was sort of a milestone. Throughout April, consortia like Helpful Engineering, and I think there are European uh, consortia as well, um, brought together engineers and started to get better organized. And I'd like to thank those people for doing that. On May 1st, it was pretty apparent that the maker community had succeeded in doing what you might call DIY PPE, as Helpful Engineering discussed, that um, making masks and uh, face shields was effective and that, that we had really made a difference. However, as Tim said, ventilators are much harder. Now, by May 1st, in what we might call the West or the wealthier nations, it appeared to be the case that uh, ventilators were no longer going to be in high demand. And there are three reasons for this. This is, this is not really a mistake on anybody's part. There were three important learnings that happened. Around March 15th, major manufacturers, including Ford, GM, uh, maybe Tesla, maybe Dyson, started manufacturing ventilators under license, as well as the fact that the existing medical manufacturers ramped up production. So that increased the supply of ventilators. Around April 15th, doctors continued the process of learning how to treat the disease. And so invasive ventilators are still needed in some cases, but they're needed less often than we thought on March 7th they were going to be needed. So um, it's important that this technology be available to doctors, but it's needed in a lower percentage of time than uh, we thought, at least that's the current thinking. Um, Dr. Schultz and, and Professor Malentine may discuss that in the next session. And then third, the other thing that happened was on March 7th, it was clear that China, which has a very controlled authoritarian regime, was able to control the virus. It wasn't clear that the liberal democracies in the West were going to be able to do that. Now, by May 1st, it became clear from the experience in Italy and New York City that social distancing works, that uh, although uh, Italy and the United States and New York City have not eliminated the virus, they have at least flattened the curve, but they have done so by undertaking extreme measures which may not hold. As of right now, the US commitment to social distancing is starting to fade. We do not know what is going to happen. If we define a ventilator not to be a purely uh, invasive ventilator, which can only be used when the patient is heavily sedated, but to include the detection of spontaneous breathing modes so that it can be used non-invasively with a mask or a helmet, then it may be that the demand for that kind of ventilation is actually going up. Now, in some parts of the world, there may be a large number of machines that provide that kind of ventilation. In other parts of the world, unfortunately, there are not. As of this weekend on May 15th, it was very clear from the data that some parts of the world are experiencing exponential growth. Uh, those are Mumbai, Tanzania, Brazil, and Russia. Um, there may be other examples. Um, as Tim said, personal protective equipment and sanitation will save more lives than invasive ventilation. Uh, however, this conference is about ventilation. We need to work on all of these things. It's also the case that if you do not have a good supply of therapeutic oxygen, you should probably work on that before you work on ventilation. It may be that approximately 5% of patients end up needing some kind of respiratory support that we might call non-invasive ventilation. It may be that around 1% of people who get the disease require invasive ventilation. Perhaps it's lower than that, but that's approximately it. Um, in a way, this is good news because the maker community can address all of these problems. We can make non-invasive ventilators that are less likely to cause injury to the patient 
than invasive ventilators. Public Invention um, started early building this spreadsheet of uh, all the open source ventilator projects. And we created a rubric for the evaluation of them based on openness, the ability to be built independently, community support, how much testing they have done. We try to keep this up to date. It's not easy. At the moment, there are over 100 somewhat open source ventilator projects on it. Um, now, redundancy is good. It is good that there are multiple projects trying to build open source ventilators. But if we were one team, if we were a planet-wide humanitarian engineering team, we wouldn't have 100 teams trying to do the same thing. We would modularize the problem. So Jenny and I came up with this basic modularization of a ventilator. Um, the basic components are an air drive. That's what makes the air move. It could be a bag squeezer, a pump, a bellows, a fan, a pressure uh, gating valve. The second module is a sensing module, which senses the pressure and flow in order to allow you alarming and monitoring to make sure that the uh, ventilator is working correctly. In some designs, the sense module might feed data to the air drive to control it. That's not necessarily uh, required, but it might be used in some cases. And then finally, you need a controller and a user interface. And the user interface is extremely important because overworked um, and undertrained staff can make a mistake with the user interface, can misunderstand something and harm the patient even if the ventilator operates perfectly. So the problem of training and having a consistent user interface is extremely important. So uh, Public Invention has addressed the sensing module with a device we call the Ventmon T0.1. And I'd like to thank Gloria Clark who manufactured these for us. We have shipped four of these free of charge to teams that use them. We're calling it T0.1 because it's currently a tester. The act of being a sensing module um, makes testing and monitoring are almost the same thing, okay? Um, now, the key to reuse among teams is to have good standards. If we have standards for, in the case of sensing, respiration data, that is, we can control, we, we can have a way of talking about the pressure, the flow, the volume, the temperature, the oxygen content, the humidity, then we can share data between teams. And you'll see an example of this. Now, um, it's not for any one organization to set the standard, but we have created a draft standard. Of course, it's open source. You guys can make comments on it. It's in our GitHub repository. And it does something very important, which is to standardize the dimensional units used. So that if one team is talking about centimeters of water, another team is not talking about millimeters of mercury, for example. And I'd like to thank Jeff Mulligan for a lot of work on that. Now, we, use, we have produced a byte level standard so that we can use I squared C, but we have a JSON binding as well. We have produced software, and I encourage you guys to go to these websites. They should be live right now. You can see the Ventmon producing moving trace data if you go to these URLs. Um, what, is, what you're seeing is the Ventmon hooked up to the ARM-E device produced by the Million Vents team, which is part of Helpful Engineering or under Helpful Engineering's umbrella. And it produces the user interface display you're seeing there, which is clinically what clinicians want to see when they have something hooked up to a patient. Now, this is in test mode. It's not hooked up to a patient. I believe uh, the Army team has it hooked up to a Michigan test lung right now. And it shows the things that you want, pressure, flow. Um, the bottom trace actually shows humidity, temperature, um, and computes the volume of each inspiration and expiration. That allows you to compute the clinically important features and to alarm on them. This software is necessary for testing. I do not want to say the software is awesome, but it consumes a standard data stream. Therefore, if someone doesn't like the software that I wrote, they can write their own and consume the purge data stream and it will work just beside this. Likewise, you can produce this data stream, uh, this user interface from our software without having a vent mod, so long as you conform to the standard. 
by creating such standards for both respiration data and control, we can do the engineering modularization of the problem. Okay, for example, there, uh, it's very common to build a uh, ventilator based on what's called a bag squeezer. So you, you take an ambu bag like this one and you squeeze it. And um, it, it, there are certain advantages to that. Some people have said that's not a good way to build a ventilator. If we had a proper control standard to control the air drive, you could start with a bag squeezer and when the bag breaks, or becomes stiff or wears out, you just replace it with a pump. The patient and the doctor don't care what produces the air, as long as it produces the air in a very, very carefully controlled manner. By doing this, we might allow different teams to work on different segments of the overall ventilator problem. And by the way, Rob Geisbert has written um, a very nice set of essays on his system called the pressurizer, which is not really a ventilator, it is an air drive. He has solved the problem in a way of doing the air drive. And I'm working with him to try to work with our standards. This uh, is too big to really go over. But the point here is, this is the way you modularize things. The red lines that you see on the screen need to transmit standardized data. If they do, we could have a hot swappable air drive, which would uh, provide tremendous advantages. OK. So. Um, the principles that I think demand openness and modularity. This problem requires openness and it requires modularity. As Tim said, this is 90% testing and 10% design. Ventilators are simple, but simple does not mean easy. They have to be very, very carefully controlled in what they do. Engineering modularity, as I've discussed here, provides supply chain resilience. Why? Because if you can't get one part in Kenya or Brazil or wherever you are, you can replace it with another part so long as it conforms to the standards. Softening or smartening of components so that they can interact with known electrical standards and known information standards allow versatility through replaceability of those parts. Mutability of design provides flexibility of treatment which I think is incredibly important. We want to give the doctors all the, uh, the possible changes that they may require as they learn more about this. Cooperating teams might let us move to faster deployment through uh, reaching the critical path and saving the first life. And finally, as Tim said, openness is the key to having confidence through peer review and third-party testing. In this situation, you want your ventilator to be tested by someone other than the team that built it. Why? Not because the team that built it has some sort of malfeasance, but because they're proud of their work and they don't want anyone to call their baby ugly. So having a third party examine it uh, is useful. Now, to those of you uh, who have built what I might call non-smart invasive ventilators or dumb bag squeezers might be another way of saying this. Your time has not been wasted, all right? What has happened as a community is we have evolved. We started out thinking non-smart invasive ventilators were enough. We have learned it's better to build smart, which means able to sense spontaneous breathing, non-invasive ventilation. I believe we don't know what is going to be needed in the future. It may be that our efforts are simply mothballed for the next epidemic. It may be that doctors learn a different kind of ventilator is needed for this effort. By building an open, open ecosystem, we can handle that uncertainty better than anything else. Um, okay, so I unfortunately can't see the questions while I'm in presentation mode. So I'm going to stop sharing now and try to answer a few questions. Okay, the common data format is on the public invention GitHub. It's well documented in a markdown file there you can find the specification. It's also embodied in code uh, in um, both JavaScript and C code. If you want to use, we're trying to improve the C binding for it. Uh, who is speaking right now? I am Robert L. Reed. I am the founder of Public Invention. So Jamie Waters asked, um, how much does the flow sensor that you showed cost? If you mean the Ventmon, uh, the bag of parts costs about $250, 
we are giving them away free. Uh, we have been given a grant to give them away free to teams that are doing design work. However, it's completely open source, so you can build your own if you mean the vent mod. The flow sensor is a part. Uh, uh, as Tim said, that part is now very hard to obtain worldwide. However, uh, Helpful Engineering has um, open source repositories for building your own. Here's an example of one using a 3D printed Venturi tube, um, which is a different way of doing it. Okay, Michelle, let me go ahead and let you begin. Thank you very much for your questions. We may be able to answer some of these questions in the Slack uh, after we're speaking. So please just keep the questions coming and we'll get them all answered. 